Thank you so much, Paul. And, and guess what? He's in charge of the slideshow, so I get to boss him around a little bit, which is kind of cool. Anyways, I, I am really, really grateful to the Rio Grande Foundation and their understanding around policy, how important it is that families are heard and children's needs are met, and that that contributes to strong communities, a strong economy, and to uh, a better New Mexico. And so I, I just, I have to say thank you to the Rio Grande Foundation for making this happen and putting so much effort into it. Um, today, uh, this presentation is, and I don't have my slides in front of me, so I'm gonna have to look back here, is about private choice with it. Is it in reach within New Mexico? And we actually do have some options. You can go to the next one, Paul. We actually do have options that already exist in New Mexico. But first, let me just define, school choice is very, very broad. It includes school choice within the public school system, children being able to transfer out of their school district, that the school that they would attend based on their zip code, and being, to ha being able to have more choices. Online is considered a school choice. Um, dual enrollment, they're, they're, it's very broad. This particular presentation is about school choice options. So what exists nationally are, are vouchers, and that's a funding system that allows public funds to flow directly to parents, and they use them to pay tuition at a qualified private school. And it's the school of their choice. If they wanted to commute, they can commute. If they wanted to be right around the corner, they could. Oh, I, I should say, nationally, the statistic when, when school choice happens, people think there's gonna be this mass exodus from the public schools. It's actually less than 20% that actually transfer out. And the biggest gains for students are seen within the public school system. When there's competition, public schools improve. And so school choice is good for everyone. And school choice, in my opinion, is choice for families, it's choice for students. And it's choice for educators, many who have a lot of innovative ideas, a lot of experience, and based on the very burdensome regulatory environment, aren't always able to implement those projects. So it's not just school choice for students, it's for everyone, and everyone benefits. So education savings accounts, now that's something that one of our sponsors, Amer uh, Americans for Prosperity, the New Mexico chapter, is really focused on, and that's a special savings account, it's funded with public dollars. Parents use it in a variety of ways. So a parent could keep their child in a public school system and say, but my child needs tutoring after school. Or maybe they have sensory issues or they're, they're really inclined to music and music makes them happy. And when they have access to music lessons, they're much more focused and effective in school. So parents make these decisions to help their children reach their full academic potential, which takes a whole child approach. So it's not just what happens during the school day, but it could support them outside of the school day with extra work curricular activities, all kinds of things that, that qualify. And those vary um, state to state. And of course, they can use it for private school. And in many states, homeschool curriculum, they can be reimbursed for receipts for eligible expenditures. The tax credit education savings accounts, these are parent-managed accounts that are funded by nonprofit organizations. We, have, we haven't had these in New Mexico. We've had something similar in New Mexico. But parents put these in there and they earn a full or, or partial tax credit. We don't have a New Mexico tax credit, um, but we had some pilots that aimed to get there back during the Johnson administration. It was very, very successful. It was Educate New Mexico. They still exist in a very small scale, but when that was in its heyday, it, the idea was that we were piloting this in an effort to get legislation passed. It was just, it's just extremely difficult when the number one funder of Democrat candidates is the unions. And so that's probably been one of the biggest barriers for us is um, being able to pass legislation that would provide the tax credit. But we had a really great success this year that I'll talk about later. Um, so the tax, tax credit scholarships um, are a little bit different and those are private school scholarships provided by nonprofits and funded by donations. And these nonprofits and donors get a partial tax credit. And then there's tax credits and deductions on individual tax credits and deductions that allow parents and family members to receive state income tax relief for approved educational expenses. Again, a variety of things. None of these exist in New Mexico. We had our very first win. I believe it's a win around school choice. It went into effect July 1st, and it was expansion alignment with federal eligibility around the 529 savings accounts. And that was traditionally, prior to 17, was used primarily for college tuition. And in, 19, in 17, that was expanded to include trade schools. And also, if the state allowed, it would also include K-12 private school. So after in the seventh year of pushing for this, 
uh, a, it was carried by the minority leader in the, in the House of Representatives and actually co-sponsored with the, the um, with Senator Worth, who's this, is, what's his type? He's the leader on the Senate side, a majority leader on the Senate side. And they co-sponsored this as a tax reform policy rather than a school choice policy. It received no opposition at all. It also, nobody flooded the rooms. Normally we'd go to the education committee if it got a hearing and very, very much opposed. This passed quietly without opposition, signed by the governor and went into effect. There is a 529 account, uh, a presentation from those, the director of that foundation. I think it's the next session of the 529 fund. I would encourage you to, the, three, the 350 session. I would encourage all of you to go to it um, because families, friends, neighbors can provide up to $10,000 a year it, 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 you set up the account per child for K-12 private school. And that creates, it's a tax deduction. So it reduces your tax liability at your federal level. And New Mexico is one of only four states that gives a dollar per dollar tax credit in the, on your state tax form. Now, you have to have a liability to receive that refund, I believe. I'm gonna go to that session to learn a little bit more. It's so new. But the New Mexico's definition of family is broad. So I can, if I feel close and, and I feel like my neighbor is family, then I could designate my neighbor's child as the beneficiary of my 529 account. And you're able to change that every two years. So that, that's, a, that's a form of choice. It definitely reduces the cost of tuition for parents who are paying privately. Okay, so would you go to the next slide? Sure. And I forgot to put two more things on there. I can't forget. So, so in just, in, in 2019, right around COVID was starting, we had five states that offered private school choice in, in, a, in a robust way. Just since COVID, we have over 19 states that are offering either a, a voucher or an ESA or one of these types of tax credits that are available. It's growing really rapidly. The benefit of COVID, I would say, is that parents got much more engaged in their children's education. People, educators, tried innovative approaches and they worked in very diverse ways. Micro school is an example of something that emerged out of COVID, I would say. It definitely grew its popularity. I never heard of it before. And it has bipartisan support. A lot of these, these school choice have bipartisan support now. Um, so when we talk about private school being in reach in New Mexico, it should be in reach everywhere, but especially in the state that ranks absolutely dead last in all indicators of students' out outcomes. You know, from my perspective, I feel like all, all options should be on the table. Okay, you can go to the next one, Paul. So in New Mexico, oh, I did the 529s, okay. So in New Mexico, we do have private foundation tuition scholarships, and Peter from the Daniels Fund is here somewhere today, and they have been phenomenal, phenomenal supporters of private school. You can apply for direct funding to the school. Um, they do a lot of startup. They do a lot of innovative approaches. They do uh, teacher training and, and uh, a lot, a lot of, of options with the Daniels Fund, but also they are doing more and more private school scholarships. And I believe, I mean, he's not in here, but I believe the average scholarship per family is around 2,500. And so that, that's uh, pretty nice when the average cost in New Mexico, I, I believe, is around 6,500. It may be a little less than that. I don't know if I'm telling you a national data, but it, it doesn't cover all the tuition, but it definitely helps. Um, so, and there's also Educate New Mexico. There's more, but there's Educate New Mexico relies on donations, and then they uh, select their recipients on lottery scholarship. Uh, Walmart, I mean, lots of people. What are, what are some more groups that would fund private school in New Mexico? Individual scholarships. The what? Children's Scholarship Fund. This Children's Scholarship Fund, I don't believe it's in New Mexico at this time, but there's the Connor Family Fund. I mean, there are some. If you do a Google search of scholarships, um, there are private school tuition scholarships in New Mexico. Uh, they're not enough and um, we need more. The one thing that people don't know a lot about is that public schools and school districts can receive the full allocation for a student, which in Albuquerque Public School, what is it right now, Paul? 27,000? Over $30,000 $30, Albuquerque Public School is getting per student. And so they get that full allocation even if they send that child to a private school. And that if that this is with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Individual Education Act. So if a fan, if a public school cannot meet that child's need, that school district is allowed to pay for private school tuition. And so so a good example would be like a smaller classroom. Micro schools have smaller classrooms. Most private schools do. And maybe a child has sensory integration or they're on the spectrum, and a smaller environment is all they need. 
to thrive academically, but the public school average classroom is 36 and they can't accommodate that and the child's having difficulty. In, in that IEP and by federal law, that school could pay the private tuition and keep the change, and keep the change, and meet that child's need while also, per, also having dollars in their fund that they didn't have to cover. I mean, once the tuition's paid, the rest of that's unrestricted and stays within the school district. So the, st the child stays enrolled in that school district, but is being placed at a private school. Now, we have, I've tried that as, as a founder of a private school. When we had, we had a child who's med med medically fragile, we have children who are deaf or hard of hearing. You know, we have a public system, for the deaf hard of hearing or, hearing or the school of the deaf, um, or the blind, I'm sorry. They would do that because it was, a, it was an exchange within the public, a type of public school. But I could never get them to do to place a child in a private school. And the reason they'd say, if we did it for you, everyone would want it. They didn't say, we will figure out how to meet the needs of the child. They didn't say, we can't afford it. They, they would acknowledge that it was an option and then say, but if we did it for you and word got out, then everybody would want that. So they have to have an IEP. That's the starting place on that. But that is an option in New Mexico and in all states, because it's federal law, for a child's needs to be met, a child with special needs, to have their private tuition paid by the school district of which their zip code is, is located in. Okay. Um, yes, sir. So, so if a parent has a child with an IEP. If a parent has a child with an IEP. And says, I want to go to a private school. And says, I want to go to private school. Then the district has to pay that. The district has to pay. Well, no, in the federal law and in the guidance, there's two ways the child goes to a private school. Placed by the school district or placed by the parent. If they're placed by the parent, then the parent pays the tuition. Now, the school districts, they're called LEAs, a, a local educational agency. They function as the fiscal sponsor for all children with special needs until they turn 21, whether they're homeschool, private school, or public school. And the special education services, when they attend the public school, it's called an, an edu individualized education plan. When they attend a private school, they still get funding, the federal funding, and it's called a service plan. And that has limited funding, but it doesn't, it doesn't touch tuition. But the school district can. The interesting thing about the individualized education plan is the parent, by federal law, the parent is the child's expert, the parent knows best, and the parent guides those decisions. Unfortunately, you know, I mean, we had a session earlier, was it, the government breaks the law all the time, and only through a, a civil suit would you be able to probably make that happen. But New Mexico passed the New Mexico Civil Rights Act, which creates a $5,000 penalty when someone's civil rights are violated, and up to a $2 million payout if someone's civil rights are violated. And children with special needs are part of that uh, protected class. And so I hope that, uh, that parents who feel like their children's needs can be met at a different location and are not being met at the public school uh, will choose to sue because we need to get the precedent set where children are the priority, not the facility and not the district. I, I, you know, one of the things that really broke my heart during, the during COVID was getting calls from parents with children who were severely autistic and they, the regression that they experienced without physical therapy, occupational therapy, like children in middle school going back to diapers and not wearing clothes and not letting their hair be brushed and not being able to be bathed and the school district refusing to provide those services or to pay a, a private therapist who would provide the services, refusing to do either. And then, um, you know, when children had sensory issues and wouldn't keep a mask on, not allowing them to go to school even though their IEP designated those special needs. You know, it was it, it, unjust. Children's lives were changed dramatically and possibly permanently. And so um, we need to stand up. I mean, you know, it's one of the reasons I, I'm willing to go wherever I have a chance to grab a mic and say something is because more people need to know that they have rights and to exercise them. Okay. All right. We can go to the next one. Okay. There have been a lot of studies in New Mexico, a lot of surveys conducted over a decade. I mean, I found studies from different universities over uh, periods of time. One thing that was consistent is that the average New Mexican thinks that our school system is not adequately preparing or equipping our children for life success. Um, that is a bipartisan position. And bipartisan position, and I mean like over 70% believe that we should have reforms to our education system. 
Now, people don't necessarily think of school choice as a reform. You know, people in the Yazi Martinez lawsuit, there was a lawsuit that said New Mexico's not providing, they're taking federal dollars and our kids are not getting free and equitable education as compared to other students in the state and other states in the nation. And, and that's happened in lots of states. And even in Democrat, other Democrat states, when those suits were settled, it ended up in school choice, private school choice. So I mean, we've, you've got private school choice in Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, and in New Mexico, it was spend more dollars, you know, and, and identify minorities and, and set up special, uh, special funding for, for people based on risk factors. And so that's the way the judge ruled in our state. I personally think it should have been appealed, but they stopped short, you know, they didn't quite take it long enough. But all the surveys show, and so there was a, a, a survey done of over 600 people, likely voters, I didn't put the reference, I should have, on whether, and, and the results of that survey, on, and it was just likely voters, it, was, it, it, it surveyed everyone. And is New Mexico doing a good job? 60% said no, and 48% of the people who said no were Democrats. On tax dollars following children to their school, 63% were in favor of that, including 45% Democrats. Nearly everyone who responded agreed that the state's education system needs change in some kind of way, and they needed it right now. So the will of the people is education reform, and the will of the people, the likely voter, is that dollars would follow students. So when we talk about is there a path towards school choice in New Mexico, it's what the average citizen and the average voter wants, regardless of their party affiliation. Okay, Paul. I think it's always interesting, and we had some headline news. Uh, New Mexico made headline news for you know, suspending constitutional rights, but did you guys hear about the president of the union in, uh, what state was it, Chicago? Yeah, teacher's union president, and, and she's sending her son to private school because she said that you know, the public school wasn't meeting her son's needs, she's, and that's truthful. Like, so, so people say public school is failing and they're making a choice for their child, but then stay committed to it, an, antiquated institution that was designed to teach the masses to be moderate and to work 40 hours a week and to, to, to test to a median, right? Rather than every child reaching their individual potential. And they just stick to it and just fight for it and want to keep it the way it is. And it's just heartbreaking. But so she, she goes and takes her son to a private school and she's the public school union opposed, opposing private school choice. In fact, calling private schools fascist. And you know, President Obama probably wouldn't be the president of the United States if his grandparents hadn't hadn't paid the price for him to go to private school. So our first African-American president had the privilege of going to a private school because grandparents paid for it. So he becomes the president. Uh, the, the DC Opportunity Scholarship provided minority low-income children with scholarships to go to private school. And it was producing just amazing outcomes. The students were making great gains. I mean, they were just doing so much better than their peers that didn't have that option. And so, you know, how heartbreaking is it that he ends that opportunity scholarship at the same time that his children were being enrolled into one of the most elite private schools in the nation? So it's not unique. Those aren't unique headlines. Studies have shown, and it's consistently true, that the very lawmakers who vote against school choice for your children choose private school for their children. In fact, the mayor of Albuquerque, right here, he graduated from St. Pius X, where we're standing today, this is where he experienced his graduation and he hit his wonderful degree that he got that led him on to Harvard, I believe. And Michelle Lujan Grisham, she went to St. Michael's. I mean, I can literally go on. And I think one of the things that was most shocking to me, hey, I was proud I, did this, I would do the same thing. During my children's, uh, both my children started preschool in New Mexico and graduated from New Mexico schools. They did private school, homeschool, dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment. We did everything under the sun uh, because it was based upon what was going on in their lives. Lots of different factors, including their academic needs. But um, whenever, during COVID, out of school time programs, like boys and girls clubs, rec programs, child care centers were allowed to stay open. All the public schools were closed. Well, it was, I was getting calls from a lobbyist or getting a call from a legislator and like, how do we get, what are these learning pods and how do we get them started? These lobbyists and lawmakers, House and Senate, were finding teachers, hiring them, and in some cases using child care centers and out of school time programs for their ch 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 where their children were during the school day. And so they created solutions. It wasn't a micro school, it was a learning pod because in our state we were allowed to have groups of six with a teacher. But only 
in a licensed child care facility or an out-of-school time program like a rec program, Boys and Girls Club, those sorts of settings. And I mean, the legislators and the lobbyists found ways to make those solutions work for their children. And a lot of them didn't go back to public school when it was over. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So I, I don't remember what the statistics were, but I think the, oh, am I done? Um, I think that the, the latest figure was like 30-some percent of uh, Senate right now and 40-some percent of House, like nationally, because there's been surveys done, chose private school for their children. And the two slides that I didn't add, the two things that I didn't put in there, and I should have, was dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment. So you can access a little bit of school choice by uh, going to the public school and, and talking to them about your children doing dual enrollment. So it's very robust in Albuquerque, CNN, and, and people use, there's a lot of coursework that high, that high school students travel to the community colleges and to the universities to do, but that's, that's possible all over the state. And if your child's enrolled in the public school, um, that's, that's an option. The school has to prove it. But if you are homeschooling and you want to access this, you can go to the school and say, will you sign off on my children's dual enrollment credit? And that is a way that it is paid for by the state. Concurrent enrollment is for homeschool and private school. Dual enrollment is for public school. If a child is enrolled 51% of the time in a public school, they get 100% of the funding. So when my daughter was in high school, I would go to the high school and say, can you sign my daughter up? Driver's ed, FFA, um, this in dual enrollment course and this dual enrollment course. I did it so that it would be free, but the school got the funding for my daughter and she attended Western New Mexico University. My son didn't want to do that, so he just we just did his as concurrent enrollment, which required me to pay fees, student uh, you know activity fees. We had to pay the the books, we had to pay for the materials, and in some cases, materials for a science class can be three and four hundred dollars. But by working with your local district and, and saying to them, look, if you want hundred percent of the funding for my child, and you get this this allocation to to help cover the dual enrollment course, sign you know if you want to be responsible for the these transcripts. We'll, we'll you know, transfer them back into our private school when we're ready. And they did that because it was financially beneficial to them. And they also really wanted to test my daughter and have her grade, her student performance in their overall test scores. So there's lots of reasons why you should partner with your public school. Um, one of them would be if your child has an IEP. Another would be if you want to get dual enrollment. And if you are choosing private school, uh, we do have a law passed in New Mexico, homeschool, private school kids, there was never anything preventing a school from allowing a homeschool or private school kid to participate in co-curricular activities. There's nothing that prevents them. But there, some said yes, some said no. And New Mexico Activities Association didn't have a limitation on that either. But now we have legislation that requires them to let them participate in two co-curricular activities. It could be, it could be um, environmental fun and a sports. You know, in the next semester it could be uh, FFA and I don't know any any sort of co-curricular DECA whatever is is a co-curricular uh, two two classes a semester. So the Mexico it's not the New Mexico a Athletics Association it's New Mexico Activities Association. So there are homeschool and private school kids that participate in all sorts of sports through the NMAA as a um, athlete or participant through the, their public school. So there are ways to access some things and give you a little bit of autonomy in your options as a parent. Okay, so that's really all I have for the slides, except to say what is stopping it from happening is public will. And I think last week, or I guess it's been two weeks now, uh, when we saw citizens rise up when our governor decided to suspend constitutional rights, what did it take? It was less than a week before she, she didn't rescind, but she amended her policies. And if parents, if, 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 if we were, as outraged as we should be, or we express the way we feel when we're talking to our spouse at home or our mom on the phone or telling them what you, your child is experiencing. I remember one of our microschooling stories that I had, I, I had the privilege of touring some microschools and hearing some parents tell their story. And this mom tells the story of the child who, I mean, there are children who are so uncomfortable in their school setting that they attempt to take their lives. And this, this story was, at a stop sign when the child tries to get out of the car and run away. But yet when they found the right place, instead their children, what, work, it's time to go to school, and saying goodbye to their friends and hugging their teacher when they leave, and, and a joy, of, a, it has to be a joy in learning. And everything we know in child growth and development tells us that children are active learners when their needs are met, 
and when they're safe and secure in their surroundings. And is that a reasonable request for a parent to expect? And to raise our voices at the level of will, that percentage, that's probably a higher percentage of citizens saying that they want school choice than citizens who think it was, a, I mean, some people want gun control. They, you know, I, I bet that's, that there's a higher percentage of families that want school choice or citizens in the state that want school choice than objected to the governor's emergency health order. If we were as vocal about that, boy, we could pass school choice. So is it in reach? Absolutely in reach. And what does it take? It takes us. And so um, we all have elected officials and they're, they're all up for election. House, Senate, right now we have local elections for the school board. Every single candidate should be asked if they believe that dollars should follow students to the place. Of the, they'll say, yes, I believe in school choice, but then you have to ask what kind of school choice. And if you don't clarify and you don't make them say it, then the answer is school choice within public school system. So you've got to say, do you believe that the dollars should follow the student wherever the parents believe is the best place for their children? And maybe that is public school. Maybe it's an online charter school. I mean, it could be any sort of thing, including private school and including parochial school. And if you attended the first, if you were here for the opening session and you heard the lawyer from Ed Choice say, that is absolutely legal. Because these dollars are not benefiting a institution. They are benefiting the student. And that's what we want. We want higher student outcomes. Nobody would say no against more dollars to students, but we deserve a rate of return as taxpayers and students deserve a, a higher outcome in their performance. So um, find out who your elected officials are. Talk to them. Make sure they know where you stand and how you feel. Because they tell us like if one person comes to us, it's representative of a thousand voters. So I mean, if you've got 10, 15, 20 people telling you they want school choice and they want options, and you know, ask them where their kids go. You'll be surprised at the answer. Um, attend town halls. Just, just ask, stand up and ask that. If you like someone and they're right on the issues, volunteer on their campaign. I mean, let's help them get elected. You know, in the last cycle, there was, I, I'm more involved in the House side because that's where I served and so I was watching those races. There were eight races that were determined by less than 3,000 votes total. And three of them were so close, they were then, if it's less than one percentage, there's a recount. And so they were so close that there was a recount. So a group like Americans for Prosperity coming in with a volunteer army to help those fit those seats, it's doable or a group of moms, which I think Moms for Liberty is a great name, and I think parents speaking up for what they want for their children is a great thing to do. I don't know why that would be considered domestic terrorism. But I mean, I think that if, if we go door to door and we say to people, we really want you to vote for this candidate, whether you're knocking on a dim door or a Republican door, independent, because we want improved student outcomes and they believe in dollars following students, you're gonna resonate with the majority of New Mexican voters. So volunteer. It, it just door knocking and phone calling is a huge thing. Um, and then engage during the legislative session. There are always school choice bills that get introduced. And I can tell you as someone who introduced them when I served, uh, the union shows up in full force. And like, it's like the sheet metal workers union. And it's like the elevator operator union. And they're like, we oppose this. And they always say, because we're standing up for our brothers and sisters and the union and the teachers union. But I mean, like, do you know how many teachers feel trapped in a failing system? And they want to be innovative and they want to solve problems. I, you know, one of the schools that we toured, it was like a teacher of the year, or administrator of the year um, at these micro schools when I got to go tour in Nevada. Um, one of them was, I think, one of the highest ranked administrators in the state. Their school had a really high ranking. And one was like a teacher of the year, administrator of the year. And they joined together and started a micro school. And it was really cool to tour that and see the sort of uh, the innovation and what they were implementing out of what they experienced in newer best practices. So um, engage. So uh, you're welcome to take my number down. That's my personal cell. Uh, when it comes to school choice or anything I can do to help parents or make referrals or do what I can, um, I'm always willing to help. And I don't know how much time we have left, but I'm happy to answer any questions. How long? We got 10 minutes. Okay, yes, sir. I've heard in New Mexico, I'm relatively new to New Mexico, but I've heard in New Mexico it's either the 51st or 52nd, whatever. Yeah. Why isn't there more it's a, so he said, I've, I'm new to New Mexico, and I've heard that we're ranked, you know, 50th, 51st in the nation, and that's correct, dead last in child outcomes, and why isn't there more outrage? I, I, I don't know, because we legalized recreational marijuana? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just joking. But I mean, like, I don't, I, I do not understand. I do not understand why people aren't paving, you know, just hitting the pavement marching around the school districts with signs. I don't know, I don't know. When the 
I, I, I love my community. I live in Truth or Consequences, and Elephant Butte Lake is our baby. And when they started draining the lake, I mean the parades. They brought their boats, and they circled the state capitol and made sure everybody knew, don't drain the lake, because we, we you know, brought the boats up and circled the capitol, you know, made big, big deals. We had news press, all kinds of stuff going on. And I don't understand why that outrage isn't there. It's a different situation where globally people will say that the education system as we know it, which comes from the Industrial Revolution, which was the idea of the haves to train the have-nots to perform at their standard and to become a workforce. I mean, everybody knows where it came from. And everybody knows that it's antiquated. And all the data shows that it can only, you know, if you've got a class of 30, it meets the needs of that middle 10. And, and 10 are left behind because they have no clue what's going on and we keep progressing. And 10 are bored out of their minds because they're not being challenged. Everybody knows this. But then they say, what about your school? Oh, well, my, my school's okay and my teacher's okay. Their child outcomes are not different. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. The other thing that's very interesting is watching top 10. And, and I'm, not, I'm not for the abolishing the grade system and, and adopting the equity grading system. But when you look at top 10 valedictorians, salutatorians, and when you, of course, I've done a lot of scholarship reviews and see them having ACT and SAT scores that are just absolutely subpar, but they have 4.0s and, you know, all kinds of AP classes. And you're like, how did they become the valedictorian? You know, and when, when 70 some percent of the kids on the lottery and opportunity scholarships do not complete their college degrees, there's a problem. But there's something unique in the public education world where parents will acknowledge that the system is bad, but not to the point where they're, they're willing to say that where their child sits, their waking hours is bad. I think that's, it's anecdotal. I don't know. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, we had a bill, and, and we had a Democrat senator carry a bill that was a form of education savings accounts, but there was parameters about it. It wasn't for all. And so someone like me, who has a hard time getting a bill heard, was thrilled to see it. Now, I didn't go testify for it because I didn't want to hurt the chances, um, but I was thrilled to see it, and I was okay with that because I thought, you know what, if we can start something and they could see the improvements if these outcomes are measured and you can see the, the gains these individual students make when they have opportunities for choice, then it would grow the movement. But then, you know, it's hard because you can't get everybody on the same page because there's people who oppose that because it wasn't truly open, it wasn't accessible to all. So it's hard because you need a crack. And if you look, if you look at the people who are so good at changing public policy, they start with a pilot program. And in New Mexico, a pilot program, I'll give you a good one, community schools, if you guys have heard about community schools, and they want to add childcare and breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, tutoring, homework, help, school clinics, social workers. I mean, like, you don't, I mean, you don't even need to be a parent anymore. And so you just wake up, you put your kids on a bus, they'll do tutoring and homework help with the Wi-Fi that's on the bus on the way. They get to school, they'll feed them breakfast, they'll feed them lunch, they'll feed them dinner, they'll have after school programs, they'll take care, get, send them to the school-based health clinic, they'll take care of everything. I mean, like, that had a $10 million, 10 million, I would love a $10 million pilot for school choice. $10 million pilot happened during COVID, could have no deliverables, and went to $100 million the following year as a pilot. I'm okay with pilots because I've seen pilots become permanent. It happens all the time. And we have what's called the, the school reform fund. We've had such a surplus of oil and gas that dollars, instead of reverting them back to the general fund, they've been creating all kinds of funds. We've got funds for water quality and infrastructure and transportation and hunt, uh, there's over 100 funds now. And one of them is called the School Reform Fund. So when PE, some allocated PED dollars are unspent, these dollars revert to the School Reform Fund at, I don't know what's in it right now, but a year ago, during the legislative session, it was over 160 million. What if we could get some of those School Reform Funds, it doesn't even take legislation, allocated for a choice program? And maybe it's the model that Nevada did around, I was just learning, this is why it's so important to come to things like this, uh, that's called the TOTS program, and it's around the eligibility based on children's, uh, if they qualify for uh, SSI, because they're special needs. 
I, I don't care where the pilot starts. We have to put a crack in a system where the union makes all the decisions, and we have to put a stop to us being divided over the differences of, of what we should and shouldn't do and what's right. Because, I mean, dollars following the student is the right thing to do. Um, it's going to be hard to get there. Okay? We're going to have to leave it there. Um, schedule reads that the next panel starts at 1.15. Happens Thank to you. be me. Okay. So, um, oh, he doesn't okay. mind giving up his time. No, we'll I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you.